Here in Washington, we're invested in worker safety. It makes sense for business and workers. If we can foster a culture of safety and reduce injuries, it's a win-win. Both L&I and contractors are worried about safety hazards. These are the things that can kill or injure a worker immediately. These are the focus of safety programs like fall protection. But there's other hazards that are more subtle that have long-term health effects. Health hazards come from building materials and can cause chronic diseases, such as respiratory disorders and cancer. Because the effects are not immediate, these hazards don't get the attention they deserve. Remodeling contractors in particular could be exposed to lead, asbestos, silica, and mold all on one job site. These topics have different rules and regulations, but there are similarities. First of all, the routes of entry are primarily the same, inhalation and ingestion. No one wants to get sick. The long-term effects of exposure to these hazards include respiratory disease and cancer. The general principles of protecting the worker are the same. Contain the dust, use work practices to minimize the exposure, wear the personal protective equipment that's required, and decontaminate before you go home. On the regulatory level, these four topics can be overwhelming. The goal of this video is to educate contractors on the regulatory requirements of residential remodel work in Washington State. Contractors need to identify if the job has lead, asbestos, mold, or silica. Contractors need to know what licenses, certifications, and training they need to have for each of these hazards. All the regulatory agencies have the same goal, to protect the worker and to protect your business. This video will illustrate how a good contractor with a strong safety culture will address these hazards. So I just did a walkthrough on this project we have on this old 1960s motel. And as we look at it, the previous owner had done a bathroom remodel and they wanted to make it more accessible. And what we're seeing is now there's problems because they did not use a registered contractor. And now we're looking at those problems and how we're gonna solve them. So my construction company is a certified firm with the Department of Commerce. So we are aware of the hazards that might be associated with a pre-1978 building uh, and the lead paint that might be involved there. We've got a few options. We either need to assume there's lead-based paint present or we can take a EPA certified test kit. Um, the other option would be to take in a paint chip sample and determine if there's lead-based paint on the project. But since I took that class, things have changed. The Washington State Department of Commerce now requires you to register, register with them in order to even work in Washington. And what's nice is before we start the project, we educate the public with the booklet Renovate Right, which helps protect children, uh, pregnant women, uh, from the dangers of lead paint that are present. And so it's nice to feel like you're doing something good before the job. So as I'm looking into this project, uh, I noticed some problems right away. And one area was in the bathroom. Uh, there was mold, visible mold, around the toilet, underneath the sink. And when you can see mold, that's an issue. Uh, you're looking at health problems for not only the customer, but myself working on the job, the people I have working on the job. Uh, some of the health concerns there are uh, can affect allergies. Uh, there could be toxic properties with the mold. Um, and respiratory problems. So you've got issues now just, just with the fact that we're finding mold and seeing mold there. So then uh, the homeowner also asked if we could remove the old popcorn ceiling and right away my concern there is possibly of asbestos. So that now creates a, another issue we have to look at to see if we're even gonna be able to do the job. So we went ahead and had an AHERA inspector survey the project for us. Because without that survey done, you could be looking at a $250 fine per day from Labor and Industries. So if it is asbestos, 
I don't even know if it's a job that I'm personally gonna be able to take on with my staff. It might be something I have to hire out. So I'm gonna have my team look into that. And the last concern on the project is the customer really wants a sprinkler system, which is great, but we are gonna have to cut through the concrete to put that in. Now, if the concrete has silica in it, then there's a hazard concern I have for my employees there. Believe me, it can be very overwhelming at times for a small business owner like myself uh, to know all the rules involved to see if I can even take on a project like this. Now, fortunately, I have a very talented office manager. Uh, she does a lot of research because there's no one resource to find out uh, where we need to go uh, to get the safety programs, make sure we're in compliance. She handles that very nicely so that we can make sure that our employees are not exposed to anything hazardous. So we have this project that we're bidding on and my boss talked to me and asked me to do some research on the rules that might apply for asbestos, lead, silica, and mold because we're going to have to deal with all of those on this project. I knew we were pretty on top of the lead stock because we've done that kind of work in the past, but we really had no idea about the rules for the other three, asbestos, mold, and silica. So I went to the lni.wa.gov website and used their search tool for all of the topics. And I was really surprised to find out that we weren't actually following all the rules for lead in construction. Our certified renovators class didn't cover that we need to have baseline medical surveillance of a blood lead level test done of our workers, and then a follow-up test after 30 days of exposure over the permissible exposure level for lead. So I followed up and did some research, and there are a few occupational clinics here locally that do that BLL test that we need, and the cost is pretty reasonable, so I think we're going to send our guys there. The next portion that I did some research on is about air monitoring. We need to do that so we can see if we're over or under the PEL, and then what type of respirators our workers need to be wearing. We're going to need some help with that part for sure because we've never done it before. Though the non-certified workers training through the Department of Commerce's RRP rule does teach our workers about the dangers of lead, there are just a couple technical things we need to add to our training so that it meets LNI standards. If a worker reaches above 50 micrograms per deciliter of lead in their blood, then they have to be removed from the work area. Also, chelation therapy or removing the lead from the blood using a medical procedure can't be used as a measure for compliance. Additionally, we need to make sure that our on-staff certified lead renovator is also designated as a competent person for lead and understands LNI's standard 296-155-176. A respiratory protection program is required, but we already have that set up under our overall safety program. We do medical evaluations online and yearly fit testing, but what I had to do is update our respirator um, selection chart to include lead specifically. And that would let us know which respirators we need to pick based on the results of our air monitoring. And we need to be a registered contractor with Labor and Industries, yep, and a certified firm from the Department of Commerce for the lead part of the work, we've got that. Um, the training that we've taken and given to our workers covers the lead safe work practices and the requirements for that, and also best practices for silica. Even though I work for a small company, I think it's great that my boss takes the time to make sure we get, we get safety classes a couple times a year. Also, he gives us weekly safety meetings too. As a matter of fact, I just finished a non-certified works class for lead-based paint. In this class, I learned about LNI rules and hazards of working with lead-based paint, how it affects workers, and also extremely how it affects pregnant women and children. The contema is to make sure that dust, they don't get out of the work area. We also need respirators and disposable suits. So I change my clothes, that way I don't take dust to my house with my family. 
There's two ways for lead to get into your body, which is inhaling or ingesting. Once you do either one, it gets distributed through the blood in your body. The week I wear a respirator, they make me shave. I have a smooth marble face. So when I initially got the list back from my office manager, it did seem pretty daunting, but actually it got handled in one week. We sent our workers off to get their baseline blood lead level tested. Something new for me there. Then we did some additional training on lead using LNI's PowerPoints. And then we had to go through our respiratory plan and make sure that it included lead work and making sure that we were using the right respirators for that job. So I bought the personal monitoring equipment so that we can monitor the jobs. So what we do is we monitor the breathing area for eight hours and then we send the cartridge into a lab and then they let us know what the time weighted average is for the tasks that we're doing. So it takes a week or so to get the test results back. Now we might already be done with the job, so what I do is just go ahead and have our guys use the full face respirators with the P100 filters, that way we know that they're safe and we're in the clear. The other thing is uh, having a shower is good, but it's not always feasible. The idea is we're trying to send our employees home without any contamination so there's no poisons going uh, out to their families. The other thing we needed to do is add a specific decontamination procedure after the job. Now we'd kind of been doing this, but uh, we needed to have specific change areas, also hand washing facilities, along with an eating area, anytime we're working on a job that contained lead on it. So there are some new rules proposed for silica for things like medical surveillance and training, but those haven't gone through yet. Because what happens is silica can settle into the lungs and do a ton of damage. So we're careful and we are required to do air monitoring to make sure that our workers are under the permissible exposure limit for silica. And so what's really nice is the containment, the work practices, the PPE, disposal, and decontamination that we already use for lead really work as best practices for residential silica. As long as we're not doing something like sandblasting with silica, then we're covered. For things we typically do, uh, like concrete cutting, granite countertops, we're covered there. And we make sure to use HEPA vacuum shrouds with tools that make or create dust and use wet methods when possible to lower uh, any dust there and also clean up on a regular basis. So the good news is we can handle lead and silica on the job with our current crew and the training that we already do. I'm actually really worried about the asbestos part of it. Here, let me just read it to you. The definition of an asbestos project includes the construction, demolition, repair, remodeling, maintenance or renovation of any public or private building or structure, mechanical piping equipment or system involving the demolition, removal, encapsulation, salvage, or disposal of material or outdoor activity releasing or likely to release asbestos fibers into the air. Whoa. That was just the definition of an asbestos project. The rules involved in being an asbestos contractor are huge. First of all, you have to be registered as an asbestos abatement contractor, which is no big deal. It's about $1,000 a year, but the hard part and the expensive part is the training. We'd have to send one of our guys through a five-day asbestos supervisor class, which would be really hard for us because we're a small crew. We can't be without a guy for that many days. And then anybody that's on the job has to take an asbestos worker class, which is four days long. And then both of those, they have annual refresher classes that are required as well. So the costs just keep adding up because in addition to paying for that training, we also have to pay our guys to be there. I don't think that it makes sense mathematically for us to do this small job. We really would have to do a number of these asbestos jobs just to cover the cost of training. And then another couple other factors that we need to consider are insurance. That has to change if we're gonna do this type of job. And then also we have to send our workers to get annual physicals that include a chest x-ray and a pulmonary function test. Those don't come cheap. But my boss really wanted to know everything that was involved before we gave up the job. So I went back to the website to do some more research on asbestos itself. 
Asbestos-containing material, or ACM, are materials that contain more than 1% asbestos by weight. And then presumed asbestos-containing material, or PACM, include things such as surfacing material, thermal systems insulation, and rolled or vinyl tile flooring that was installed before 1981. You just have to assume that there is asbestos in those materials. Then the actual work is divided up into a class system. There's class one, two, three, and four. So class one work, that's the most intensive. That involves the most equipment and training and work practices to be in compliance to do the job. Unfortunately, on the job that we're bidding right now, it just has a simple popcorn ceiling. Um, and it did test for greater than 1% asbestos when we had our Ahira inspector come and look at it. So we really have to do class one work here. We already do the containment that is required for this type of work. So we've got that part pretty under control. And a lot of the work practices are the same for the type of jobs that we're already doing. Um, but we will need some additional area monitoring equipment. That is another thing that's going to add to the cost of this. That equipment is really expensive. We also have to have a supplied air respirator system with tight fitting respirators a negative air machine and monitors to measure air exchanges. Oh my. And then we have to have a three-stage shower and decontamination system. That's a lot. I ran the math really quick and uh, calculations come up to $15,000 of equipment. So that plus the training costs we talked about earlier, we're up to over 20 grand. It really is gonna be expensive to do this asbestos part of the job. Two-hour asbestos awareness training is required if a worker might come in contact with asbestos. Contractors can train their own employees using a PowerPoint presentation at the LNI website. Asbestos can be found in a lot of different building materials. So asbestos is not really dangerous when it's all bound up in a product that's maintained and intact. When the product is disturbed, Tiny invisible asbestos fibers can be released into the air that the workers breathe. Once inside the body, these asbestos fibers can become embedded in the air sacs of your lung called alveoli. So the body's defense mechanisms cannot break down these fibers and scar tissue forms. So when the scar tissue builds up, it makes breathing very difficult and painful. This condition is called asbestosis. It doesn't just sound terrible, it ruins people's lives. You can also get a cancer called mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining of the lungs. And you can develop other cancers in the digestive system. The asbestos awareness class doesn't let contractors do any asbestos-related work, but it does inform workers what to do in case they run into potentially asbestos-containing material, which is to let the boss know and stop work. Really no wonder asbestos companies specialize in that kind of work. I'm not sure, personally, the math makes sense uh, to be an abatement company, except for the fact that we're running into so much mold. We're seeing mold more and more on jobs that we look at. And actually, after doing the research, recommended containment, work practices, equipment, PPE, and disposal are actually almost identical to asbestos work. So if I'm going to gear up to do class one asbestos work, then I can safely do mold as well. So I have a big decision to make. 
If we're going to do this type of work, then we're going to do it right. And it's going to be a huge investment, so I do have a lot to think about. I don't want to be like some contractors who will just have the homeowner do the asbestos related work. You know, after learning the dangers, how much the equipment is that's needed to protect the workers, uh, all the damage you can do to, to your lungs, you know, I just wouldn't feel good uh, suggesting that to a, a customer. And so basically, if I don't get set up as an asbestos abatement contractor, then I'm going to hire one to do the work. My job is to educate people on and enforce the standards of my agency. It's nice to see a company taking safety seriously, taking care of the families, their workers, their business, and keeping everybody safe and working. This company did the research, bought the equipment necessary to protect their workers, and provided the training to do the job safely. They used the right containment, work practices, personal protective equipment, and decontamination to keep their workers safe. Elle and I would like to thank this contractor for doing a great job.